So last week we kicked off a new series on the Gospel of John. And uh, John, almost a hundred times, talks about belief. These things are written, he said, that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And believing, you might have life in his name. So he makes it clear. This is why this is written. This is why this book needed to be created. This is why God inspired it, that you might believe. So today, we're kicking off with John chapter 1. So uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Look at John chapter 1. Keep your Bible open there. We'll make several references back to the first 14 or so verses of John chapter 1. In this series, one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to share some of my favorite stories as we go along. Uh, Things I've accumulated over a lot of years and uh, don't get to tell very often. You know, sometimes you share a story you really like. Uh, once, and then it's years before uh, you may circle back to it. Well, I'm going to share a lot of good stories. And this is, when it comes to John chapter 1, this is my favorite way to introduce the story. So here we go. Father Damien. It's a great story. Father Damien was a priest, and what he was known for, famous for, was his willingness to serve lepers. Uh, Native Hawaiians, uh, years ago, Uh, Suffered from a lot of uh, diseases inadvertently introduced to the Hawaiian Islands by uh, ships that would come through, uh, traders and uh, sailors. And thousands of people on the Hawaiian Islands died of things that just uh, had no resistance to influenza and syphilis, ailments that uh, had never before affected them. And, And this included the plight of leprosy. Uh, It's known today as Hansen's disease. Fearful of its spread to the population, so loathsome, so horrible, this skin-rotting disease, leprosy. The king over the islands declared that all the people with leprosy would be rounded up and they would be moved to a colony on the island of Molokai. And there, quarantined. Well, they were there. And on May May the 10th, 1873, Father Damien arrived on that secluded island. He was already serving in the Hawaiian Islands, but he, he, he volunteered for this responsibility to go and care for the people, uh, secluded, isolated, mostly left to die on the island. Now, he was introduced, presented to the islanders. They gathered up, and this is how he was introduced. This is one who will be a father to you, who loves you so much he does not hesitate to become one of you, to live and to die with you. Now, at that time, there were about 600 people with leprosy in the colony. And his first action, Father Damien's first action on Molokai was to build a church. He was more than a spiritual leader to these people. He lived with them for 16 years. He became fluent in their language. He determined he would go through life with them. He bandaged their wounds. He embraced their diseased bodies, bodies no one else would touch. And he preached to hearts that so desperately needed hope. He organized schools. He organized choirs for these folks. He built homes so that they would have shelters because they'd really just been dropped off and abandoned for the most part. The story is that He personally, during those years, by his own two hands, constructed around 2,000 coffins so that when these folks died, they would be buried with dignity. And slowly, the leper colony became a place to live instead of just a place where people went to die. And Father Damien was a giver of hope. He didn't worry about keeping his distance uh, Nothing would separate him from these people. He ate with them. He hugged them. He didn't hesitate to bandage their sores, their open sores, care for their physical needs. He got close. And the people just loved Father Damien. One day he got up to preach his uh, Sunday sermon. And it began in a unique way on this particular Sunday. Because he said it this way. We lepers... Now he didn't just live with them. Now he was one of them. Now he too carried the disease. And just as he has lived with them and served with them, he would now die 
uh, as they died. Now they were in it together. And that brings us to the first chapter of John. The first four books, and I talked about this in a different context last week, but the first four books of the New Testament are referred to as Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a lot in common. We call them, they're much the same, similar. They're, they're the synoptic Gospels. Matthew, and each of them, by the way, they, they, have, a, they have a target. You know, everything that you read, uh, every news story has a slant to it. The, the person who wrote it has an angle that, that they are trying to communicate, a, a particular viewpoint. Well, the Gospels uh, are written like that too. Matthew writes to a Jewish audience, and so to do, to, well, you, that's when you find, starting at the very beginning, you have a genealogy that, that traces Jesus' ancestry all the way back to Abraham, because that would be really important for a Jewish audience. You get to Mark, and Mark doesn't do any of that stuff. He just dives in, because he's writing for a Roman audience. And the Romans didn't care so much about where you came from, but they were really interested in what you did. And so that's why you have that action-packed gospel according to Mark, where it says, and every, seems like every paragraph begins, and then, after that, next. He's always moving. Here's what Jesus did. Here's what he accomplished. For Luke, he's writing for a Greek mind. So he begins, he gives his method of research. This is how I came to accumulate this. I'm, it's an orderly account. and He tells about his method of research, but he also has a genealogy. But his genealogy goes all the way back to Adam, because in, in Greek culture, they believe they were all descended from the first man, and uh, that would be really important to communicate with a Greek audience. But John, writing after the others, began his gospel not in time, but he begins his gospel in eternity. And his point of departure is not history, eternity. He doesn't explain any details about a night in Bethlehem, or shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night, or angels, or wise men, or stars in the heavens. Here's what he writes. And it's one of the most beautiful poetic passages in all literature. And certainly a high water mark in scripture. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him. Not anything made that was made in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of a man, but of God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this revelation of yourself and of your son and I pray that today uh, this declaration of the person of Christ would make a difference in how we walk through life and in relationship to you in Jesus name amen Isaiah the prophet was writing in the 8th century BC and in uh, Isaiah 64 it's one of my favorite chapters in that great prophecy of Isaiah Isaiah cries out to the Lord oh that you would rend the heavens that you just open up the heavens oh that you would rend the heavens and come down and one day he did and that's the story of John chapter 1 one day God came to his own earth and this is how his message begins uh, we lepers he became one of us he took on flesh and bone and he wasn't just helping us he was one of us now he was in our skin and we were in this together the story of the incarnation God becoming flesh is a story of love 
And a lot of people didn't recognize him when he came because they were expecting more special effects, more razzle-dazzle of how that would look. But he became one of us that he might communicate with us most clearly his love for us. The Apostle Paul described it this way. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, as the, as, as the exact representation of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall, will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Matthew records the promise of the angel. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. He is God with us, all of us. As I told the children earlier, I have a special fondness for the word with. Will you go with me? Will you go with me to the store, with me to the movies? Will you go with me to the doctor visit, to the hospital? With is a, it's an encouraging word. And with Jesus, <laughs> just before he ascended back into heaven, having accomplished the work of the cross, the victory of the resurrection. Remember the, what he said. Behold, I am with you, with you, always to the end of the age. With you. There are no limitations placed on that promise. Always means always in the Bible. He's not just with us at church or with us when we're good or with us when things are bad or with us when we are good, he is with us always. And it was not enough for him to send prophets to be with us or priests to be with us. It wasn't enough to have apostles with us or angels with us because they could not begin to accomplish all we needed and still need. And so God came himself and he sent his son and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. If you study the major world religions, one of the things you're going to find is that a lot of them have trouble with this concept of God taking on a human body, God becoming flesh. Islam says God is one and he sends others. He sends angels or he sends prophets or he sends books, but God is too holy to come himself. He would never touch down on planet earth with its filth, its brokenness, its unholiness. And that's what makes the Christian faith so completely different from everything else. It celebrates a God who came down to be with us. And it is his nature to be with us, to come to us, to care for us. In our sinfulness, we'd always run from him. He came to us. He took the initiative to come to this earth. And he walks with us and talks with us. And he lived on earth as one of us, with us, with us. The story of the Bible isn't the story of people desiring to be with God. Never in our sinfulness would we reach out to him. The story is God wanting to be with people. And as wonderful as the promise is that I will forgive you, it's not the most prominent promise in the Bible. Uh, As wonderful as the promise is of eternity in heaven for those who believe in him, it's not the most prominent, common promise in the Bible. The most Consistent, frequent promise in the Bible from God is, I will be with you. The promise came to Adam and Eve before sin entered the world. He would come to the garden and walk with them in the cool, with them, with them in the cool of the day. The promise came to Enoch, who walked with God. It was made to Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, Amos, Mary, Paul, and too many more to even name. God with us. We are told in Isaiah 41, fear not, the Lord says, for I am with you. We are told in the 23rd Psalm, the shepherd Psalm, even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, fear no evil, for you are... Oh, there we go. Thank you. That's one. Heather, if I had a prize, I'd give it to you, but... 
One of you is still with me, and I appreciate that, you being with me. Yeah, we are told, fear not, for I am with you. Fear no danger, for you are with me. God gave, God gave the Ark of the Covenant. He gave uh, manna from heaven, the temple, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, over and over again. Through symbol, through presence, through power, through miracle. It's, it's like uh, post-it notes just plastered all over our world and our lives that say, I am with you and I'm not going anywhere. Jesus came to make tangible what was already true, the nature of God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And at the end of the story, when God brings all this amazing, gracious plan to completion, heaven comes down. It's described this way in the Revelation. And I heard a loud voice in the throne saying, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them, and they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. Over and over and over again, this truth is declared. Now, the question arises often for us, you know, what is God like? Would I, would I want to be with God? Would God really want to be with somebody like me? And people have plenty of opinions about it. Well, the God I believe in, or the, the more frilly version of that. Well, when I think of God, I think I, think I connect with God when I'm out uh, dancing through the flowers in my, in my short pants. Whatever, whatever your uh, crazy vision of God is. But here's the great... <laughs> I even surprised you that time, didn't I? Here's the great news. God didn't leave us to guess what he's like. He didn't leave us wondering how would he do things and what would be important to him. He put on our shoes and he came to show us, to reveal himself, to communicate with us. Look to Jesus and you know what God is like and you know what God would do and you know what would be important to him. Jesus in those big I am statements we referenced last week, seven of them in John's gospel that helps to outline this book. In those I am statements, he declares, I am God with you. John 1, 18, you look on down a few verses from where I stopped reading a moment ago. No one has ever seen God, the, only, the one and only son who himself is God and is at the father's side has revealed him. And here's, here's what we learn about who God is through the clear testimony of our Savior as John describes it in these few verses. Jesus is eternal. John says, in the beginning was the Word. And the term was here, there, there are different words in the Bible that have meaning and they have uh, in the original languages, sometimes it just means what it means. And sometimes there is more that is revealed when you look at the original languages instead of just seeing it in our translations. The term was here means without reference to origin. It doesn't mean was, used to be. It means was without reference to origin. The theological way of phrasing that uh, is... There was never a time when he was not. He has always been. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God. As Jesus said when challenged by his critics, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. Jesus did not just appear in Bethlehem in the first century. Jesus is eternal, and he is about an eternal work. Listen to these verses. In his high priestly prayer in John 17, Jesus said, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The risen, exalted Christ declared in the Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So here we are today. What does that mean for us? So here we are today in times like these. And there's, uh, there's conflict in Syria. And the Russians are threatening as a result. And Iran and Israel, this is pulling them into greater conflict and greater potential for, uh, for really bad stuff in the Middle East. All these things converge. In times like these, 
And we feel it in our own lives. We feel it in our own communities. Instability and chaos, failure and fake. The story of Christ comes to us and it is eternal, unchanging, unaltered and you can depend on it today and you can depend on it tomorrow and God is not going anywhere and you can find security in that that great message for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life Jesus is eternal and it touches our day to day Jesus is the word second John transports us all the way back to Genesis 1 1 in the beginning is not a common phrase. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, John says, was the word. And by God's word, by his spoken word, order came out of disorder. And out of darkness came light. And out of non-being came life. And God sent this clear word to us in the form of his son, Jesus the Christ. In God's creative world, it, it, word, it brought all things into being in Genesis. And now again, God's word comes to bear on planet earth. And this time, out of spiritual disorder comes spiritual order. Out of spiritual darkness comes spiritual light. And out of spiritual death comes spiritual life. And a word is a means of communication. And Christ comes to be God's supreme, full final, finest communication to us of what he expects from us, of who he is, and of how we can know him. At the beginning, J.B. Phillips in his translation of the verse, he says, at the beginning, God expressed himself. God spoke. He is a God who wants to be known and make himself known, and he is a God who speaks and most fully in Jesus Christ. And he has a word for you every day. If you'll spend time getting to know Jesus and spend time in his word, God has a word for you for whatever the needs of your life. Here's the third thing. Jesus is the life. And in verse 4, John writes, in him was life. There are different stages to life. One man described it this way, and many of you, we, we look across our crowd, and you go, we're in different stages of things. What you're experiencing may be different from what I'm experiencing because of the stage of life. Here are the stages of life. Spills, drills, thrills, bills, ills, pills, and then wills. Those are the stages of life all spelled out. What is the purpose in this life? You will never discover your purpose apart from relationship, commitment to Jesus Christ. Jesus came to give meaning and purpose to life, and he's the only one who can. He's the creator, and until you get to know the creator, you'll never know why you were created. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John, last week we read, these things are written that you may believe. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. John 10, 10. And the message paraphrase, I have come that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. I don't know where you are in life today, but I know this, that life is always going to be a stretch. It's always going to be a struggle. It's always going to feel empty apart from Jesus Christ. God sent his son into the world to teach us to live lives that count. Teach us to live lives that matter, not just for today, not just for tomorrow, not just for time, but for all eternity. And he came to free us from sin, from meaningless treadmill living where I'm just going to get up, go try to make some money so I can buy some stuff so that I can eat, so that I can sleep, so I can get up in the morning and go make some more money so I can keep doing this. He came to fill our lives full, to give us eternal life with him forever. Jesus came that death might die and that we might live with him forever. Life. The fourth thing, Jesus is the light. And we'll spend a whole Sunday on Jesus as the light in this series. John said the life of Jesus was the light of men. And we need light because we live in a world that is so dark in so many ways. A broken world is dark with the, the, the consequence and the disaster caused by sin. And what happens is that 
we, we don't like the darkness. We go looking for light, but in our sinfulness, we'll go looking in all the wrong places. So people say, well, I'm going to try to find my light and fix my brokenness. Money, success, education, religion, just medicate my pain in destructive ways. The light of Jesus Christ shows us the way to relationship to God. And he is the only way, the only way to have a relationship to God. Some of you came in today, you're stumbling in spiritual darkness. You're searching, but mostly you're just bumping into things in the darkness. Jesus came into a world of darkness and said, do not be afraid. Let me show you the way to God. The other part of the story that John touches on is that darkness will not overcome the light. That darkness runs away from the light because Jesus is the great overcomer. Fifth thing. Jesus has a story worth sharing. It's a story that needs to be told. It needs to be repeated. It needs to be always on our mind and on our lips. In the midst of this poetic passage, John the Apostle wrote about another John. In verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now we're talking about John the Baptizer. John the Baptist. We'll spend next Sunday focused on his amazing life and the uniqueness of his story and what we'll say is John came to point others toward Jesus. Just a few verses over, it says, The next day, John the baptizer saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Look to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins. That's Jesus. We're going to see how that story gets told. But one thing never changes in John's gospel. The story is told with a clear purpose. John writes that Jesus came to his own creation... It means he came to the world that he made. He came into his own, and his own received him not, is I think King James' version of that. He came into his own, his own creation, a world that he made, and his own, his own people. The people of the covenant rejected him. Some people receive him, and some people don't. And that's still true today. How do you receive him? Well, as many as did receive him, to him he gave the right to become children of God. How do you receive him? Who believe in his name, the totality of his being. Trust in who he said he was. He is the son of God. Trust in what he did, in paying for sin at the cross. Trust in what he accomplished in the victory of the empty tomb and the resurrection. And put your faith in him, surrendering your life to him, believing, believing as it said almost a hundred times in John's gospel, that you might believe. Now, this is another one of my favorite stories. I started with one of my favorites. I'm going to finish with one of my favorites. I don't, haven't told but once, I think, since I've been here. This, you know that I'm a pretty highbrow kind of art lover, right? I'm that guy. So we're going to do some art appreciation because I'm, I minored in art appreciation in college. Or, I don't know, auto mechanics or something. I don't know. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. So this is a famous painting, right? You've seen this maybe before. Edited for church. <laughs> I edit a lot more for church than you might imagine. <laughs> Stories about you guys. Uh, I edit a lot. Most of you have seen a rendering of this famous painting, Michelangelo's brilliant painting, God and Adams on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And it's interesting. So you have, you have God on the, on the right-hand side of that. You see him, and you see his eyes intent. He is, you can tell, his hair is blowing back as he is leaning into this. He is coming on the clouds of glory. The angels are symbolic of the swiftness of his flight as he comes reaching out to the man with great intent and purpose. The painting is sometimes called the creation of man. Uh, actually, it's called the creation of man. Uh, some scholars say it ought to be called, most, most say the creation of man. It should be called the endowment of Adam. You look at the picture, and so they haven't connected up yet, but Adam already has life. 
So what's happening, according to some interpreters, is that he's not being offered life. He's been being offered life with God. With God. And so God comes and he reaches out. But you see, even though he comes, there's still a, a, just a space in between. It's not a big space. God's done all the hard work. He's done the heavy lifting on this. Jesus came, sinless son of God, dies on the cross, pays for our sin, raised from the dead. He's, the, he's done the hard part. He's reaching out. And all the man has to do is just reach back just a little bit. Just take a simple step of faith, commitment, surrender. Yes. Okay. Now, Adam in this picture is a lot harder for me to interpret. Uh, he looks like he's sitting on his back porch without too much interest in anything. He couldn't be any more lackadaisical about how he's going at this. He seems disinterested, low commitment, indifferent. And it wouldn't take that much effort. And it wouldn't take that much effort for any one of us. He's already Emmanuel, God with us. And he is near. And he loves you. And he has done his part. He came to this earth and put on a frail human body. Faced every temptation to sin. Yet without sin. Died on the cross to pay the penalty for sin. Raised victorious over sin and death. And today he reaches out. And he says, I want, I want to forgive your sin. I want to have a relationship with you. And I want you to be with me forever in heaven. He's reaching out. And he's just inviting us to reach back in faith. Surrender. Believe, trust, commitment. God's offering the greatest of gifts. And you don't have to earn it. You don't have to deserve it. You just reach out and accept the gift. Jesus came to be the Savior of the world. And he is near. And the challenge we are going to be confronted with every week in the Gospel of John is, what are you waiting for? Believe. No, don't, don't religion me. Don't cultural Christianity me. God says, believe. Commit your life to this. You lean into this, and he will transform you for time and eternity. Believe.